the, the sort of fundamentals of how I think you can find deals and um, and basically how I have found them when I first started, how my team now found, finds them um, using the same methods. You know, I think what works for me sort of three years ago works um, still today. And, you know, we've kind of also shown that it, it doesn't just work in one location. It works in multiple locations and multiple, you know, different continents as well. So, um, so today we're kind of going to go, I think it's really important, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of courses and, you know, I, I don't really believe in strategy as much as I do in, in, in sort of solving problems. And I think if you come from a, you know, any sales environment and you look to solve someone's problems, then you will naturally uh, increase your sales conversions almost overnight. The problem is uh, with most sales environments is they are taught to, you know, almost sell features and benefits. And I guess benefits is kind of linked to problems, but what ends up happening is the salesperson ends up getting so stuck on the features that they actually forget about the rest. So ultimately, uh, what we're going to go over tonight is very much for rental arbitrage deals. I think that's the quickest way for everyone to earn money. Um, I am more than happy to discuss you know, investment deals, asset purchasing deals, lease options, and everything else if you do come across those type of deals. However, I think in the main, uh, the training is very much going to be focused on rental arbitrage because I think that's the quickest way to move. Uh, I want to move quick. I'm sure you want to move quick. And, um, you know, we can we can start getting those commission checks written out and obviously we can start onboarding the properties and, and running them. So I think focusing on the problems that we solve is super important. And this is what is going to make or break whether you get deals over the line or not. Um, so it's really important uh, that you communicate it properly with the landlord and i would always advocate getting direct to landlord you can try and go through agents it's not as successful i personally think you're better off spending your time building relationships with landlords um but ultimately you you've got to solve their problems for them to be able to go do you know what they're the best person to go with and um you know i had a meeting this morning with a friend of mine who wants to get into this and you know he, he was sort of saying well why would they choose us when the market's really hot and they can just put a, a rental up, um, you know, in, with an agent and get it rented within 24, 48 hours at the minute. And, and I'm, I personally and passionately believe that we are the best tenant that any landlord could ever find. Um, I, 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 I firmly believe in that. I have done since day one, since I've been doing this and seeing the benefits of it. And as I've, got more and more experience and worked with more and more landlords, it has become even more apparent that, that we are 100% the best tenant that a landlord can ever have, especially in the UK, because we are, I mean, if you've been, I'm a landlord myself, I've got shitbag tenants, I've got a court case next month that my team have to go to, I've spent two grand on lawyers just to try and get someone turfed out of my house who hasn't been paying rent for the last 12 months. You know, these are the type of things that do happen if you're a landlord for long enough. And these are the type of things that you got to play on and you got to leverage those pain points. Um, so, you know, I am um, a big believer that you have, um, you have the problem. So what is the initial problem that they're facing? There will always be a problem as to why somebody has got their property up for rent. It might just be a case that they've got no one in it and they need the money you know, which is probably the majority of the cases. But, um, you know, the, there's the problem, there's the pain that that problem is causing, and then you can leverage that pain into other areas of, uh, or says expand it uh, into other areas of their life, which uh, typically revolve around, um, you know, their, their, their mindset, um, their, their family, their time, and their health and fitness. So, you know, just to give you a bit of an example of that is, you know, if if they've got a landlord that is experiencing, you know, like say say for example, if I only had that buy to let property, it was my only property, and I've had a tenant in there for twelve months that hasn't paid, I have had to pay two thousand pounds for court fees, 
and let's say I was on, you know, an average wage, I would probably be mentally right now tortured. I would probably be a bit depressed because I would be suffering financially, uh, which would then probably mean that I can't put the heating on right now because I haven't got the money and I couldn't take my kids on holiday this summer. And, you know, all of that might then also mean that I'm just really not that motivated to go to the gym. So you can see how that that one problem can affect so much of someone's life, depending on the circumstances. And with any type of problem that you're speaking to somebody about, you can always cascade it into those four areas of their life. And it just makes it a bit more real. Um, And it, it, for me, it really opens the opens the doors and, and, and it's the way you communicate. You've got to really learn how to communicate um, and how you speak and how you sell. And they're all skill sets. You know, a lot of people are always a natural born salesman. You know, you can sell sand to Arabs, all that sort of stuff. I, I think that's total bollocks. I think you can learn how to communicate with people and, and the majority of it is through, um, you know, test them. So, you know, say you say something that doesn't work. Okay, you try something different. You try a different angle. You try a different angle. Eventually, you'll start landing. It's a bit like marketing. You just split testing all the way, trying two versions of every ad, and then one will always outperform the other, and then you just make that one better, and then you try two versions of the better one. You wait and see which one's the best, and then you do two again, and you just kind of split testing all the way. And that is the same with you know your phone scripts to landlords, your phone scripts to estate agents, your in-person scripts with landlords in-person scripts with estate agents, all that sort of stuff, um, you know, and, and, and just going out there and, and, and who you're speaking to. So uh, the, the, the problems that we solve, we'll go over that. Um, the type of properties that work, we'll go over that. Where you can find these properties, and then we'll do a bit of a Q&A towards the end. If you do have questions along the way, pop them in the chat. I'll probably um, come on them at the end of each section. But I know whilst they're fresh in your mind, just bang them in the chat and then um, and then we can kind of go over them towards the end of each section and we'll kind of have a, a big Q&A towards the end for anything that might be, um, you know, outstanding. So uh, a lot of um, a lot of the problems that we do solve um, are relevant in every location. There's a couple in here that aren't really that relevant to Dubai um, because... Dubai is a bit, um, it, it's a bit stricter with its its laws, I guess. And uh, you don't really have tenants absconding and not paying rent. I know 2008, someone can more than happily say, well, that didn't happen then. But I think in the main, uh, you're signing into a 12-month Ajari contract. You're committed to that money. And uh, by hook or by crook, you're going to pay it. Um, typically, uh, you know, the properties are left in good standard and, um, you know, that they're, they're not having to do refurbs. Uh, quite a lot of the landlords in Dubai actually don't give a shit about their properties, which you can tell by the 15 and 20 year old kitchens and bathrooms that they refuse to replace. But um, that's a different story altogether. Um, but yeah, so some of the points aren't something that you can focus on in Dubai. But for the UK, for the US, for, you know, Australia, South Africa, you know, all those type of places, Europe, they very much the tenant um, profile, the tenant laws, they all very much reflect one another. So um, first and foremost, there are, they will not experience any voids. So, uh, you know, we are an established company. Um, I paid all my rent during COVID. I did not reach out to any landlords and ask if anything off them with a begging ball. I just, you know, I, I said I would give them a five-year guarantee when I signed those contracts. I am a man of my word, so I continued to pay them. I just found other ways to try and bring money in to help pay that rent. So um, there are no voids when you work with us. And uh, when you do work with a business that is making profit, then you are more than likely going to get paid than working with a tenant who can potentially lose his job at any time. The minute a tenant loses their job, the first thing that a tenant will stop paying is their rent. The reason being is it's not credit scored. A car payment is credit scored. Um, you know, a uh, there's many other things that are credit scored that they've got commitments to. So their rent is not credit score. There's no database or there's not a one that's actively worthwhile joining as a landlord to sort of seek out bad tenants. Um, and therefore they can get away with not paying their rent. And that is the first thing that goes. As a business, as long as we continue to make profit, 
then we will have surplus cash around us and we will also be growing as a business and therefore we have the ability to pay the, the, the rent. And obviously we are trading each and every month to bring money into that property. So therefore um, we can offer more um, security. So we there is no voids when you work with us. And that is a huge thing because, you know, even if um, even if you have a good tenant who pays for, I don't know, say the average tenant is, is somewhere like 16 to 20 months, when they do decide to leave, you are going to have a void period, whether that be a week or in the majority of most cases, it's about five weeks. So you're going to lose five weeks of rent every single probably year and a half on average. That doesn't include some of the other costs that we're going to come on to. That's just your actual rent that you will lose on the downtime of switching between tenants. Uh, they don't have that with us. There is no downtime as long as the property continues to make profit and you know the skills that and the tools I'm going to show you to identify and how to analyze should mean that we're only taking properties on that have a very high chance of making profit. You're not going to get everyone right. I've never got everyone right. Um, but we, we you know, minimize the risk of getting it wrong by, you know, using all the data and the tools that we can and have to our availability. So as mentioned, there's no turnover uh, during the, uh, the tenants moving through. There's no uh, vacancy time uh, during the turnovers. Um, there's no eviction headaches. Uh, so as, as I explained before, I'm currently going through a court battle with a tenant who knows the law inside out, uh, probably read the tenant rule book, has lived on benefit streets for probably the last two years on and off, checked out when I first took him on, passed every single credit check, had a 17 year steady job, ticked every single box you could imagine, um, and just turned into an absolute nightmare of a tenant. Um, so he, uh, just to give you an idea of where this whole tenant protection is going, uh, obviously we've got the, the pets rule that's recently come in, stating that you cannot refuse a tenant if they've got a pet, which you previously could. Uh, we all know that pets, uh, and if there's pet lovers here, I apologize, but um, they stink and they wreck your house, uh, whether you like it or not. And um, you know, if you've only got a tenant in there for six months and they've got a dog, in six months' time, you're replacing the carpets and you're definitely decorating the whole property and possibly having to, you know, replace quite a few cupboard doors. Now, um, you know, even the best behaved pets, which you hear all the time, um, they still, um, you know, do, you know, make carpets smell and, and nibble at things and, you know, scratch things. And, and that's just what pets do, right? So um, that is only going to get worse. But kind of coming back to where... The, the, the sort of land lies between tenants and landlords. When we were in court last time, they, they kicked the court, the, the court paper got kicked out because I didn't put LTD at the end of the claimant name, which I just thought was incredible considering this guy owes me 10 grand. Um, but the judge turned around and said to um, our representative that we appreciate that this is uh, owned by Luke Holmes, but it is his home. And that was the word that came out of the judge's mouth. And this is only going to get worse. And what we need to do is, uh, you know, this is the type of stuff that we need to be playing on when we're talking to landlords and leveraging. These are the problems that they will face. You know, by the time I get this guy out, I'm going to be 12, 13 grand, probably worse off than if I just never had him in my property. And, um, you know, is what it is. It's part of being a tenant. But, you know, if I then decide to just continue to buy to let that property and only make a couple of hundred pounds a month, three, four hundred pounds a month, it's going to take me a long time to get that money back. So um, these are the type of things that you, you, you've got to be, you know, I would be asking, like, I always kind of have a joke. I remember, you know, like, oh, have you had any bad tenants? You know, I've recently had a nightmare one and you go into the story and it kind of opens them up a bit, you know, and, and they'll be like, oh yeah, I had a dickhead a few weeks back. Or no, no, I've had someone bump me for whatever. I've had a couple, you know, I've had another one who, um, he, so moved in just after COVID. I was going to short-term rent it, but it was literally, I think we finished it on, may maybe i think i snuck him into the house basically i remember going around 
and it was definitely during one of the lockdowns and we kind of snuck him into the house and um, again passed all the credit checks passed everything he paid his first month rent didn't pay anything after that for about the next eight nine months and then we got an email into the accounts department after chasing it just got an email saying I've posted the keys back to the letterbox don't bother fucking chasing me you'll never find me and uh, off we went into the, the thin air and rightly so you can never chase these people and you know, we had to get a locksmith out to open the door, uh, 150 quid gone there. And then what we walked into was basically two Great Danes had shit all over the property um, and chewed every single cupboard door off, ripped every bit of the bath panel off and scratched probably every single wall. It took us about four weeks to uh, get the smell of the dogs out of the floors. So it took us two months just to get this property turned back around, eight grand lighter for the pleasure, plus the rent I hadn't had. Um, and I'd just done a refurb just before I put him in there as well because I'd just bought it and did a BRR strategy. So needless to say, I don't like tenants, which is why I do a lot of short-term rentals. But this stuff will happen to landlords if you have property long enough. And this is the type of stuff that we have to be using in our armory when we're talking to landlords. Like, you know, and, and you know, you can use my examples, you can use my stories, yeah, you can use them as your own, you know, uh, and uh, it's really important that you, you get on the same level. And, and, and it's almost building the fear that, you know, eventually they're going to have this problem. So, all right, they might get an extra 50 quid a month right now off a tenant versus maybe renting to us. Um, but is that extra 50 quid worthwhile versus, you know, the, um, what they could have by, by working with us again, no lawyer fees. Cause they're not going to need to take us to court. Um, you know, cause we're going to pay our bills. Um, th there's never going to be any issues. Touch wood. I've had absolutely no issues. I've certainly not caused any issues on any landlords. Um, I've had a couple of landlords try to be cheeky and double the rent on me recently. And I told them to piss off and I've uh, terminated the contracts and we'll give the, the keys back when they're due. But that's not because we've done anything. They're just trying to be greedy. And with a bit of luck, they'll have two great Danes in their property shitting all over soon. And then they'll be knocking back on my door asking and begging if we'll come back. But um, no end of tenancy refurbs. Every single tenant I've had so far, we have had to refurb, even if it's just a lick of paint or it's just, you know, as I said, sanitizing the carpets to get smells out or uh, touching a wall up here or there, fixing a leaking shower, fixing some damp in a bathroom because the tenant hasn't told us about it for the last 14 months and they've just let it build and build and build and we've gone in. You know, these are the type of things that do happen. Um, and, you know, on average, I think the average end of tenancy refurb is around about 1250 um so obviously some are cheaper some are more expensive but i think on average it does cost you you know just over a grand to to turn a property around for each tenant then obviously you've got maybe a month's void included in that and possibly you'll then have um the agency fees as well so you're probably looking at two to two and a half grand for every tenant that leaves your property you will not have to do viewings so as a landlord, especially the, the, the way that we'll look for landlords on sites like Open Rent, um, that means that they are looking after their own properties, they're speaking with potential uh, tenants, they're doing their verifications, um, they are uh, more than likely doing their viewings. Now, it takes on average about five viewings to get somebody into a property. So... Uh, you know, if we are going for, say, some of the bigger stock, the HMO type style properties that would work well for what we do, that's potentially, you know, five times five because they've got each room to fill. Now, um, I remember back in the early days of, of doing a lot of buy let stuff, um, standing outside, waiting for the tenant to come. I'd driven 20 minutes out my way to get there. Uh, you ring them, no answer. You text them. You can double tick and see they've read your message and totally ignored you. And so you hang around for another 10 or 20 minutes. And by the time it's gone, you've wasted an hour of your life and no one's turned up. That is a regular occurrence if you're doing viewings yourself. Um, so again, you then, you know, the amount of time wasted, if they're doing that on several properties, you know, once, twice a year, it's a lot of hours that they're going to start wasting just to try and find some tenants. So Again, you just leverage on that. You're not going to have to do any viewings. You know, um, most of these properties we might even be able to take on by just pictures and viewings. Uh, we're not always going to have to, you know, come and see them. Um, you know, but 
uh, th there's a much less hassle and time wasted by working with us. They're not going to have to pay any tenant finders fees to the agents because they're not going to need an estate agent. Now, if you do um, locate a landlord through an estate agent, then obviously they will have to pay the tenant finders fee. Uh, depending on how good the deal is, you could potentially agree something with them on that front. But I wouldn't uh, go in with that head first. Obviously, we want to try and get the best deal that we can. But uh, in the main, you want to be trying to get direct to landlord anyway. Uh, no tenant finders fees for them. Ten, most tenant finders fees are typically one month's rent. So, you know, again, if they're turning the tenant over every year and a half, then, you know, they're paying a tenant finders fee every year and a half, which adds to the turnover cost plus the void period, um, assuming they haven't had to evict anyone um, or serve any notices, then, you know, they're still, that these costs are starting to build up, which a lot of landlords don't think about until they actually experience the cost. They just think, I'm renting for a thousand. My mortgage is five hundred. I'm making five hundred quid a month. It's like, well, you're not actually making five hundred quid a month because you're not factoring in all these costs that you're going to get hit with at the end of your at the end of your contract. You know, with that tenant, um, assuming you're lucky. Again, there is no ongoing management charge, but their property is being managed. So what I mean by that is, we are sending cleaners in there on a regular basis. Um, you know, minimum probably once every 10 days if we've got the longer term bookings in. On average, you know, you're probably at least once a week. Uh, some properties will be twice a week. So we are, there are our eyes and ears on these properties. Now, I know a lot of landlords hire agencies and they do a three month check, apparently. I know fine while well, these three month checks do not happen. Uh, the majority of estate agents do not do them. Um, and that means the properties are not getting checked um, and they're not really getting value for money. Whereas um, they're not going to need anybody to collect their money. We're going to set up a, a standing order or a direct debit. We're going to pay it straight into the bank every month. And there's going to be no need for anybody checking the properties because we're going to check it for them. If they want photographs of the latest clean, we can send them the photographs of the latest clean. It's time and date stamped so they can see that we're not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. They can go on the website and see the condition of the properties and it gives them that peace of mind all without any charge. So they're getting their property managed, but without a fee and they're not having to pay a tenant finders fee to get us into that property. As I mentioned, we clean the property at least um, once a week. More often than not, we'll refurbish um, your property. My uh, maintenance guys actually just sent me one today. Um, I probably should have put the, the video on here just to give you an idea, but you know, we took on, um, I think it's, uh, we've got a block of flats basically in Durham and we're working through taking them on with this company. We've just taken another three on this week and um, they just give us them in a very, very sort of dull way. And we, you know, we'll paint some nice feature walls. We'll put them in our sort of brand standards and our colors. I think in this one, we put some carpet down uh, just to sort of glam it up a bit. And, um, you know, we've, we've added value to that property. We have made that property from whatever it was worth, we've probably added five, 10 grams worth of value on the open market by what we've done. So I haven't asked them for any money for it because I know I'll quickly recoup that cost by having the property in that condition versus leaving it plain. And ultimately they've got a better property and that's what they will get back at the end of it. Any, any damage caused by a guest we will fix uh, and a lot of landlords will say, oh, well, I've got a damage deposit from my tenant, so I'll get anything, any damages fixed from them. Well, these clever tenants, and there's a lot of them because, um, you know, they can go online and read the rules and they know how to play the game. Most people in this day and age are renting, so it's not the first rodeo when they do rent. Um, they will not pay the last month's rent and know that you'll then get the last month's rent from their deposit out the deposit protection scheme and then you will have nothing to claim on to be able to then recoup any of the damages. So just because you've got a damage deposit as a landlord does not mean that you are going to get the damage fixed from that money because I can guarantee you they'll run off and not pay the last month's rent and they'll run off. So um, that we, we have guests. We, we obviously, any guests that do damage, we've got their 16 credit card numbers. Uh, we thank them for damaging the property. We swipe that credit card on Stripe. We get that money and we go straight in and fix it. 
The guests will ring us up, no doubt, and say, why have you taken a thousand quid off my credit card? And we say, because you signed a contract saying you weren't going to damage it. And this is the state you left it in. Do you really want to argue this through the courts? No, I do not. Okay, thank you very much. See you later. Don't ever stay with us again. You're blacklisted. But thanks very much. We'll fix the property. That's the way it works now again. You know, we have that ability because of the contracts that they sign, because of the details they leave on file, we can charge their credit cards. A tenant, a landlord can't do that to a tenant. You know, you can't get the money unless they actually physically give you that money or you get it through the DPS scheme. So um, we want them for a long period of time. You know, unlike, as I kind of mentioned before, uh, the, you know, average is whatever year and a half to, to 20 months. Uh, we want them for as long as we can make profit from them. Uh, in my experience, uh, the majority of them make profit. I've handed very, very few back since doing this. Very, very small percentage of the portfolio have gone back because I um, didn't want uh, them because they weren't making money. Um, so we, we, we want most properties for a long period of time. I think the average rental arbitrage deal worldwide stands at about eight years. So in idea, you know, you might have seen some of my sponsored ads uh, where we guarantee eight years. Um, that that's the reasoning behind that because the average deal is around eight years. So um, you know, we play on that. And you know, if, if you're a landlord, you've got some guy saying, "Hey, I'll give you eight years rent guarantee, no voids, no headaches." Da 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 da. You're sort of saying mm, this sounds a bit too good. Um, but then when you go into it and you, you 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 get them to fully understand how it works, then it's almost an open and shut case and we should be dealing um, the contract. Now, there's two sides to this one. Um, obviously, I'm a big believer that, you know, they've only got one tenant relationship to deal with for multiple properties because unlike a tenant, we can take multiple properties from them. A tenant can typically only rent one property at a time. Um, uh, I have had a, um, a landlord a while ago say, well, yeah, I would never put all my eggs in one basket though. And I say, well, I totally get that. But once we've built the trust up with you and once we've shown you exactly what we can do and how easy it is and how much more profit you will make by working with us, then I guarantee you, you will put all your eggs in one basket. And sure enough, we keep getting more and more properties off him almost every month now. And I would imagine probably by middle of next year, he will have all of his eggs in one basket because he knows how good it is what we do for him. He sees how easy it is. He knows there's no hassle. Um, you know, we've even started doing some all insurance leases, uh, all insurance leases on them for maintenance and, um, you know, just making it work for him in a very easy way so we can get more and more properties. As I said, um, approximately eight year relationship per property, uh, which is, uh, you know, as I said, for any landlord, knowing that you're going to get paid for eight years without a gap and without any headaches is, is almost gold dust. Now, depending on the setup, if they own these properties in a personal name, then I can potentially help them avoid Section 24, which is known as the landlord tax. It's not as straightforward as rent guarantee on a fixed amount. But if they're open to a bit of creativeness, then we can actually help them pay, uh, you know, or help them avoid the landlord tax. Um, all legit, you know, this is, is the way it is. So for those that don't understand what that is, basically, um, I think it was 2015, maybe, no, maybe a bit later, 16, they started to bring in a tax, uh, which is now fully in play, where you cannot write off your mortgage interest as a cost if you own the properties in your personal name, which is why there was a big shift to get properties out of personal names into um, limited companies. So give you some round numbers there. If you are getting a thousand pounds rent and your mortgage interest, because most of them are on interest only mortgages is 500 pounds then you're making £500 profit per month. The tax man will tax you on a £1,000 profit per month because you can't write off your £500 mortgage interest if you own them in a personal name. This was seen as an attack on the landlords for whatever reason. Uh, they love to attack us. And, um, and this is why there was a big shift to get 
properties in limited companies because then you could write that off as a cost and therefore you're only paying corporation tax on the actual profit rather than potentially if you're a higher rate tax band earner you could be paying 45 percent tax on the thousand pounds which isn't actually true profit and effectively you'd be making about 50 quid in real terms from renting your property out. So as you can see, it was so awesome. Now I had one of the franchisees, he brought a portfolio to me um, after our meeting last week or the week before. Um, we've been working with a landlord who does have this exact problem. So we're kind of showing them how they can work with us and avoid this tax and make a hell of a lot more money. Um, so. Again, comes down to the relationship building. You've got to, you know, open these conversations up with landlords, but just have all these tools in your armory. So um, I used to actually, um, I, I, I used to, um, I used to call this the magic eight, but I think I've added a few more points now. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, including section 24, the magic 15 it's now called. So, um, I just think um, learn it and, um, you know, if you want to take any photographs of these, then, then, then take them, um, learn the, um, learn, learn the ins and outs of each and every one and uh, just ask, ask good questions, get good answers. So when you're with people, you know, just start asking questions around, you know, have you ever had this problem? You know, do you know that we do this and this and this? And oh, how do you do that? Blah, blah, blah. And if you ask good questions, you'll get good answers. And that's, um, that's one of the main things that um, you need to be doing to be able to unlock the, um, the mindset of a lot of these landlords is very closed off. You've got to remember that they've heard probably read all of the Airbnb disaster stories. And I'm sure you only need to go on Facebook to, you know, hear some bollocks about some property getting trashed and blah, 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 blah. As I always say to a landlord, have you ever walked into a hotel and the room has been trashed? And I guarantee you, if you ask that question to 100 landlords, 100 of them will say no. And you say, well, that's exactly what we do as a business. And I cannot afford for a bad review or a guest refund to have a property not turned around after it has been damaged. I'm not going to lie and say it's not going to get damaged because it will, but it's on a very small percentage. And on those small percentages, we have the credit card so we can quickly get it turned around. We can afford to turn them around because effectively the guest's paying for it anyway. And we will have it back in the standard that we need it to be to serve our next guest who booked it online looking at the pictures in all of its glory because your pictures are always taken as soon as the property's refurbed and set up and no one's been in. So it's always in its best state online. It has to represent something like that when the guest actually shows up, whether that's a year later, a day later, two years later, it doesn't matter. It's got to represent that. So we always have to make sure that the properties are in good condition. Um, so that's kind of section one. Um, they're kind of the problems that I believe we solve. I think if you get that around your head and you start speaking that language to landlords, then they will resonate with it. I know if someone came to me now and said, do you want uh, eight years rent guarantee for your house in Durham that you ship bag tenants about to get kicked out of? Had I not done short-term rentals for a living, I probably would say, hell yes, because I've had a nightmare. So please help me. Uh, and what they're doing is solving that problem. A lot of it is timing, obviously. You know, um, a lot of it is timing. You know, if they haven't had any problems, they've had a great tenant and, you know, whatever, then that's fine. And, and it might not, some of these problems, they may not have experienced yet, but I guarantee you they will, the more property they have and the longer that this goes on. Um, so, right, let's just go through some of your questions. Uh, when we're speaking with landlords, can we mention that we're working with stays in the sales pitch? Um, you can, and as it says in the contract, as long as you represent the brand professionally, um, you can say you're working with us for sure, um, and you know that you're sourcing properties on behalf of us. Um, if they then want to check out the, the website and stuff, um, I've got a new website about to get launched, which I'm quite excited about because... Um, 
the old one is a bit slow now with all of the, the, the data and information on it. Uh, so we've had to upgrade, but um, new ones out soon. It's slick. So yeah, I've got no problem doing that. Um, as long as obviously, you know, it is represented in a professional manner and it does no harm to the brand. Uh, will the landlord get the market value for their property? Um, so this is where um, I guess you guys uh, come into play. So I actually uh, pay less. I will negotiate less, but I'll actually show them how they get more. So if you think about everything that we've just spoke about, okay, so if we, um, let's say we take a property for, let's say that example there that you're saying, £1,400 on the open market. So if we took that property for, say, £100 less per month, obviously £1,200 a year less they're going to receive. However, we have previously mentioned that every year and a half to two years, that landlord's roughly going to be hit with somewhere like two and a half grand worth of costs when you consider tenant finder's fee, um, you know, refurbishment, a bit of a void period, uh, referencing, that sort of stuff. So every two years, they're going to get hit with two and a half grand. So if we keep the contract for eight years, they're going to get hit with 10 grand worth of fees over that period on average. We're asking for £1,200 per year. So there or thereabouts, probably not the greatest example, but there or thereabouts by allowing us to have £100 less on the rent, they're actually going to make a tiny bit more working with us. That's assuming they don't get an absolute disaster of a tenant, by the way. So, um, that, so that's kind of how you can explain it. But again, it depends on the relationship. Some landlords are so fixed on a monthly payment that they just cannot see anything but that monthly payment. And they believe that that's the profit. Now, again, the beauty is what we tend to do in the right areas, there's enough ADR, average daily rate, um, uplift and enough occupancy to be able to pay market rent and still make these things work. But I do always think that obviously the better you bring, the better, the better and cheaper you bring the deals to us, the more they stack up, the more likely we're going to say, yep, we'll go ahead with that one. You know, if they're tight deals um, and, you know, I don't believe the margins in the deals, we're not going to go ahead with them. So your negotiation power is going to be directly linked to your commission because the better deal you bring to us, the more chance it is that it's going to get accepted. Um, so I would always try, I always try and go below and I use that example, you know, that, you know, we're going to be paying no problem. There's going to be no void. It's going to be this, that and the other. So whilst you're giving us a little haircut at the beginning, you know, it really helps us out. It helps us make that extra profit so that we can pay the rent every single month. No question asked. So we can continue to grow and work with you as you bring your portfolio, blah, 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 blah. You know, just kind of explain uh, the benefits to them of actually giving us a reduction. Quite a lot of landlords turn around and go, I totally get what you're saying. Um, you know, I totally understand that you're right. Let's shake hands. We'll agree on that. Some might push back and say, well, no, I, I can get 1400 quid on the open market and that's what I want. And, you know, then we just say, okay, well, you know, we'll stack the numbers at that. If it works, great. If it doesn't, we'll have to pass on this property unless you can do it for X. Um, then you might go back to them and say, I've analyzed the numbers. Um, we can make it work at 1300 quid. Obviously, you know, eight year contract, blah, 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 blah. And then it might just, you know, they've been thinking about what you've said to them in between that sort of negotiation process. Um, some you'll win, some you won't. That's just the way the, the world goes. Um, by the end of the contract, if the property is damaged in any way, will we amend it, any of these damages? Yeah, of course we will. I, I don't want, um, you know, I don't want the brand to be known as people that give properties back and, and um, you know, don't, don't take care of them and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, I know um, I've, I've, I've hardly given any properties back uh, uh, apart from um, probably recently I have, but not so much on the rental arbitrage side of things, more managed properties where investors wouldn't upgrade them. They're, they're too outdated and they won't do anything with them. Um, but the rental ones we've given back recently and the ones going back at the end of this month, we will leave that in the same condition as we found it in and we put it into. I spent eight grand refurb and that, which I'll never do again, but hey-ho, I've had it for three years and it's made me money, so I'm not that bothered. But um, 
lesson learned on that one. Uh, again, just touching on that, I will come on to what type of properties work, but I don't want to be doing any work. Um, literally, feature walls, minimal sort of work. I'm not prepared to be doing kitchens, bathrooms, and all this sort of stuff, even in exchange for rent-free periods. Um, not really interested in that uh, anymore. But um, we had... We give one property back, which was in a bit of a ropey area and the neighbors just didn't like what was going on. So they kept putting the windows through. Um, so I repaired the windows, even though I argued with the landlord that technically he should be claiming on his insurance because it wasn't really our fault. But anyway, I just repaired it and just and just given the keys back. So they're pretty much doing two of that. I think off the top of my head that we have given back, but both have gone back in um, in good condition. Uh, will the rent per annum increase with inflation? Um, well, hopefully not, no. But um, if if we have to, I tend to... The contract is... Um, we can fix the term of the contract for as long as they want. It has a three-month break clause on either side. So any of us can get out with that three-month break clause. Um, the reason why I don't sort of say it's an eight-year contract is... Um, a landlord might not want an eight-year contract. They might be thinking about selling that property in four years. So you go booling in with an eight-year fixed and they're thinking, well, I don't want eight-year fixed. I'm going to sell this in four years. So what I try and do is say to the landlord, um, you know, we will, you know, whatever works for you, really. How long do you want it for? Naturally, we, we, we take them on average for about eight years, um, you know, so I'm quite happy to do that. But I do think there needs to be a bit of flexibility in the contracts. So as long as we're making profits, you'll never hear from us. You'll get paid every month and it'll be all tickety-boo. And, you know, we've analysed the property based on, you know, the whatever 300 and plus houses we've already done this on and, and you know, they're all working fine. So I'm pretty sure yours is going to be the same. You know, just building that trust, building that confidence with them. And, um, and then... Uh, you know, just getting them in, 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 into the day, really. But I, in an ideal world, um, obviously, I don't want the rent uh, increasing with inflation. I think, um, you know, you'd end up paying, um, you know, a lot more each year. But again, it just, it comes down to the agreement that you've got with the landlords. Um, some are switched on to that, some aren't. So, um, you know, it might be a case that you just say, listen, we'll put a rent review in in three years' time. Uh, and we'll chat about it. We'll put a rent review in in six years' time. We'll put rent review in nine or every three year increment or something like that. Um, you know, that's typically what I've had in the last few contracts that have sort of expired. Um, why didn't I put my property on short term rental since you had issues? Uh, the one that's gone to court, uh, he, uh, that was the very first property that I ever bought and I put a tenant in straight away and he's been the only tenant and I've not been able to get him out. So, um, that's why that one isn't, and it's probably not in the right area. Um, and the other one, I, uh, well, the, the other ones with tenants, I think when I, when I first sort of got in the property, I was very much into the diversification bullshit of, have some HMOs, have some bite-lets, have some essays, you know, and kind of keep your portfolio diverse. Um, I'm not saying that that's wrong. I just really feel like I've got a passion for short-term rentals now. I've, I've kind of feel like we've really, you know, nailed the strategy. And the fact that, you know, as my dad said to me not long after COVID, he was like, son, if you manage to get your business through COVID, there's not much that can take your business down. And I think, you know, it's a very fair comment. So, that, that then meant that we earned so much more money from short-term rentals that now I am looking to, um, you know, I just got rid of a lot of tenants out of one of the HMOs we've got and that got turned into an SA. Um, and slowly but surely, we are turning the buy lets into SAs as long as the area works, once the tenants have left. I do have quite a few in kind of leasehold blocks that I can't do it in, so I've just got to swallow the tenants. I have thought about selling them, but I don't really think I need to at the minute. So, um, that was mainly why uh, why they're not on short term. There's always a reason, but now I very much, if I can, I will. Uh, would you recommend Justin Dunes professionally or casually? What is your experience? I'm a hoodies and a hoodies and a jeans type of guy, or a hoodies and a tracksuit type of guy. Take me or leave me. Um, I think the words that come out of your mouth are more important than what you look like, 
And if you can get on with people, if you can build relationships, if you can identify their problems and then solve their problems for them, uh, give them a clear understanding how you solve their problems, you could probably go dressed as Buzz Lightyear and still get the deal. Um, what percentage under do you recommend we go under? I think you just got to look at the market, have a look around. Um, you know, again, we'll, we'll kind of touch a bit more on this tomorrow when we're analyzing deals uh, and we'll kind of go through a few examples. Uh, tenancy, I've touched on that. Do you ever pitch landlords if they insist on emailing them rather than a call? Um, yeah. Uh, I don't do email. Um, so uh, the email that I sent you all today will be one of very few emails that you'll ever get from me. Um, I, I just, I think email is the biggest waste of time ever. Um, but if that's the way that they want, I think a lot of people nowadays, uh, it's good to get them on the WhatsApp chat if you can, um, try and get them into a text chat or a Facebook messenger chat. Again, we'll kind of come on to that uh, in a bit. Um, did you say we don't need to do viewings? Um, yes and no. So for me, in the beginning, I would say you do. Uh, because you need to know how to analyze properties. You need to know what areas work. Uh, you need to build the relationship with your potential uh, pool of either agents or landlords. You're not going to build a relationship over a phone. You can much easier build a relationship face-to-face. -face. Um, I've been on viewings um, in the early days where I'm looking at a property and I'm like, this one doesn't work. And he's like, well, I've got five more down the road. Do you want to go and have a look at them? You know, and, and off we went, looked at them and, you know, oh, okay, that one works, that one doesn't, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's important to go and view. Once you get enough experience, like now, um, you know, especially on certain, like, like someone could send me, you know, someone could send me a video now of a, a tower in Dubai or whatever, the Palm. And, you know, I'd, I, I could pretty much say yes or no. Whether, whether I'll have it or not have it because I know roughly what the condition is going to be like I'm quite confident in knowing what the condition is going to be like um, if um, what I do tend to say you, there's a couple of things you can do you can send Viewbill which is like a, a company that will actually do viewings on your behalf I think you pay like 50 quid for the report um, or um, I have done deals with landlords afar where we've just basically said send us a video send us pictures we'll do the agreement uh, we'll start operating if it is not, and I'll put in the agreement, if it is not as shown on the videos or you've hidden anything that needs fixing, we'll fix it and take it out the rent. And that normally keeps you on an even keel and, and that normally works out as well. But I think in the main, at the beginning, I would definitely go and view and to build relationships. I always say to my team, like, don't view, don't view a viewing as a viewing to go and see a property. Use it as almost an, a meeting opportunity. So you're actually, it's no different to saying, I'll meet you in Costa for a coffee. You just go on the property instead to have that coffee and have that chat. You're going to actually meet somebody who can potentially open a lot of doors for you. And if you, you've got to go and, you know, don't just go and be like, oh, can you show me around? Don't talk to them. Like I would normally stand in the porch for about the first five or 10 minutes and just really try and talk to them before you even go around looking at the house because you're not there to look at the house. You're there to view the property, uh, to, you're there to build a relationship. And the more of the relationship time that you spend building, the, the more deals that you'll get for sure. Um, you know, you want, you want to be the one that stands out of the crowd. And um, it's not always easy. You know, sometimes you get to your stage and it's literally like a fucking door open, go on and you get, let us know when you're finished. And, you know, it doesn't really want to talk to anybody. And, you know, I think um, sometimes I'll talk to them just to annoy them because I think they're really bad at their jobs. But, um, you know, I think in the main, you want to um, build relationships with people. And the only way you do that is, is talking to them, ideally face-to-face. -face. Um, so, uh, is it difficult to build relationships with estate agents since they'll effectively be taking money from them as the property won't be managed by them? Um, yes and no. The majority of my deals have come direct to landlords, and that's what I would ideally focus on if I was you. I think... People see the estate agent route as the easy route uh, because they've got the stock, but it is, in fact, I think the most time inefficient route and the hardest because, as you said, there's a lot of objections. They don't really get your message. They definitely don't relay it to the landlords uh, in full. 
and they do some of them think that you know you're going to be stealing commissions from them there's also a lot of estate agents now starting to do their own short-term rental stuff especially in dubai uh but there's a lot of stuff that ha- like that happening in the uk as well um so i i think if you get direct to landlords you're going to get much better deals and you'll get more portfolios that way uh but in the main i would always still be dabbling ringing a few agents and trying to build some relationships we have got some good good relationships with agents um you know what you want to do is is probably just go on like a viewing blitz at the beginning and just try and meet as many people as you possibly can and what will happen is you'll windle it down to they're a good agent they're a good agent they're a good agent and then you just you have a handful max maybe two or three that you just um you just stick to them and you're just constantly ringing them you got anything you got anything just me again you got anything just me again you got anything you know i'll pop and see you next week i'll bring some biscuits whatever you know just build relationships with those agents never speak to anybody else in the agency just always call for them you know, so just like, hey, is Bob there? No, it's on his day off. No, by the Wednesday back tomorrow. Right, cool. Do you want to speak to anyone else? No, no, no. I'll, I'll ring Bob tomorrow. Go back. And then you, because you're building that relationship and you, then they know who you are. Um, that's much more powerful than just randomly ringing estate agents and giving some bullshit script and then just ringing another one. Uh, but you need to initially get on view and identify who the good ones are. Um, so um but, but, but can you provide some insights into challenges dealing with rental agents versus landlords um landlords are so much easier to deal with you get better deals you can negotiate better deals uh, there's no hoops to jump through um you know are they they get your message because you're telling them direct what the message is there's no chinese whispers getting in the middle and confusing things uh, for me, it's it's kind of like landlords all day, every day. So, uh, cool. Right. Next section. So, type of properties that do work. Um, apartments are good. Depend on the location. Um, I prefer the bigger houses in most of the locations. In Dubai, it's different because <laughs> Dubai is typically apartments. Uh, probably 80% of Dubai's apartments. Um, but if we were sourcing apartments i would like to try and source blocks of apartments uh you know take on 5 10 15 units in a block uh, but you know i wouldn't say no to an apartment on its own in a you know in a building with apartments in the uk you have a freehold and a leasehold typically uh, so uh, you need to make sure and then you can actually throw in a management company that look after the block on top of that you want to make sure that the contract doesn't state that you cannot do short-term rentals. And I know down south, it's probably more apparent than up north. But um, the last thing I want to do is agree a deal, buy a load of furniture, waste time setting it up to get a notice in four weeks saying, by the way, you can't do short-term rentals in here. We've been told by the neighbours that you're running Airbnb, blah, blah, blah. So that's the only thing with apartments is we've got to check the leases. And, um, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing about leases in the UK is every single one's written differently and there's no standard format. So some are written in like 1920s old English and some are written, you know, quite recently. So you just got to dissect the information. Um, I will never, ever, ever believe an estate agent if they say you can, you have to see the documentation, you have to actually read it, you've got to go through it. And again, if you're unsure about anything, just add it to your deal pack when you're submitting it in and just say, I've read this, but just want to, you know, double check, I haven't missed anything. And then we'll obviously, the team on our side will check it through. But um, yeah, so that's probably the only thing that you need to work out with apartments. Um, I am... I'm not a fan of studios, I'll be honest. I think with studios, you're paying a lot more than you would if you were paying, like, say, like my hotels. Uh, I'll pay a lot less per room uh, in rent than I would a a studio apartment. Uh, And I don't think that you're really offering much more than a hotel room with a studio. I know you obviously add in a kitchen in there, but it's normally very cramped. Um, so like for like, I think you're, you're competing against a hotel room. And when you analyze the data on that basis, normally the studio deals don't stack up. Naturally, there is a few, uh, locations that are an exception to that. But for me, I would prefer two, three bed apartments if we can get them, 
Uh, I will take on one beds as well, but twos and threes tend to work a lot better. I mentioned earlier blocks of farts. I mean, this is, for me, the holy grail in the UK is blocks of apartments uh, where we can get, you know, 5, 10, 15 units on a go. And um, uh, it just makes life so much easier. Houses, detached, semi-detached, terraced, end of terrace, uh, villas, um, we'll take all them on. Um, hotels, I will look at hotels. I seem to have a bit of a, um, I wouldn't say magic formula, but we've managed to turn a couple of hotels from what we're blowing their brains in to we've taken them over and I'm making quite healthy profits on them um, through my my tech and my automation and, and everything, the way that we kind of run things behind the scenes. So um, I wouldn't shy away from a hotel. But again, they've got to be in good standard. I'm not prepared to be doing loads of work. I got offered a hotel down London ages ago and it probably needed 40 grand's worth of work and they weren't prepared to upgrade it. It was just an absolute hostel and I, I'm not prepared to take stuff like that on. So, um, but hotels that are in decent condition, there's, hotels are actually not a bad thing to target because a lot of hotel owners are, are a lot older. Um, they've probably ran them as a owner operator style operation and that doesn't fly anymore. Um, that, that doesn't fly because they're a bit older, they're not as savvy with technology and therefore they just haven't moved with the times. But typically they've got great hotels in great locations. Um, they just don't know how to work them and they don't know how to staff them anymore. So uh, they're, they're blowing their brains in. You knock on the door and offer them a fixed rent and they will probably snap your hands off. So um, a good little opportunity there. Uh, villas, uh, again, anywhere in the world, I think villas work. I'm going to Miami and Florida next month uh, to hopefully start taking some stuff out there. Um, I know uh, Dubai, we're just taking on a five bed villa today. We took on one on the Palm last week. Uh, so the villa side of things is really starting to pick up out there. I know we had a villa out there last year before the owner moved back in that absolutely killed it. I was devastated when they wanted to move back. Um, so uh, villas in Portugal, uh, we've had them before um, and I'm looking to buy a business down there which has 75 villas. Um, so there's there's definitely villas uh, all the way. They do work in the right locations. Um, so for those that, you know, probably more so abroad than in the UK. Um, I'm not even sure if we have villas in the UK, but um, definitely abroad, they, they do work. Cottages, again, you know, places like Lakes, the Cotswolds, uh, South Coast, you know, any, anywhere like that where these, you know, type of uh, dwellings exist uh, and the, um, you know, are, are attracted or attractive to, to the traveling tourism. And again, bungalows, you know, it's just a different type of property, but uh, I'm not quite sure that's a picture of a bungalow, but um, anyway, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll agree to disagree on that one. But it um, looks more to me like a water sort of a bungalow, I guess. But um, So they're the type of properties that do work, and they're the type of properties that I would be searching for. As I mentioned earlier with houses, I would probably go for more three, four, five bed houses than I would two beds. Um, I think the, the larger properties in the, in the houses work better. That's why um, I would also be looking at, you know, websites like Spare Room, which is HMO um, portal. Now you might be thinking, well, I'll contact landlord and say two out of the five rooms are rented. Most HMO landlords are more than likely portfolio landlords because to get to a HMO strategy, especially, um, you know, quite a while ago, you, you've probably got to have bought a few buy lets along your way, built up a bit of cash, bought a bigger property, done the refurb on it, you know. So um, it's more about building the relationship with those uh, type of contacts and um, and then ultimately discussing their portfolio with them and see if they've got anything else that fits as opposed to the property that's advertised on spare room. Uh, so where can we find... Well, actually, I'll quickly answer some questions. Um, bu -bu -bu. You mentioned management. What's the difference between bringing in an outside management company than using the existing agent management? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that question. Uh, Danny, if you could almost clarify. I'll just hop off mute and just ask. ask, ask. Hello. So basically, instead of bringing in an outside management company to manage the property, 
if you're getting the property off an agent already and they're managing that property for for the landlord what's what's the difference in bringing in someone to manage the property if the agent's already there to manage it so So in in what sense i mean there's we're probably talking is there there specific like type of management like specifically yeah so an estate agent management is basically they will collect the rent off the tenant and pass it on to the landlord um assuming they get it they don't stand on the rent so if the tenant doesn't pay it the landlord doesn't get it um they will do a three-month check apparently and go to the house and just check that it's in order arrange it with the tenant and go over and do an inspection um and depending on the level of service they choose uh they may also then arrange maintenance on behalf of the landlord and they'll obviously add their fee on for doing so and then take that out of the rent each month or, or send the landlord an invoice so that's how estate agents manage um assured short-term tenancies asps normal tenants whereas what we do is um you know although we're not when i say we're managing the property on behalf of the landlord we, we, all, all all i'm trying to say is like they don't need to employ a management company because we are constantly in the property we're cleaning it all the time you know we can give them pictures if they want them but typically the landlords they give us the keys um you know i've even offered like listen whenever you want just pop back in we can give you the door codes or um, you know, whenever you want, just um, let us know and we'll send you some pictures. And they're like, oh, yeah, that'd be really good. And they never ask for them. You know, it's just that sort of giving them that security that, all right, well, they obviously are looking after my property if they're willing for me to just walk in at any time, you know. Um, so we we effectively manage it in inverted commas without, without charging them a fee because we are just managing the property as in we're managing it for our business. We're getting guests in and out. We're making sure it's working and we're making sure we're driving revenue through it. So the spin off effect to them is their properties being managed without them having to pay a fee. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. cool. All right. Uh, so you've basically provided a better management service than an agent has. Cause obviously I have heard of, horror stories of where agents don't actually manage the property check the property in you know and stuff like that yeah i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't get fixated on the word management with them because it might for like an an experienced investor they would probably start to think i don't want a management i just want rent you know so um but it's almost like you know we'll rent it off you but you're not going to need to employ somebody to manage us like technically we're the tenant but an estate agent doesn't need to manage us, the tenants, because we're not a normal tenant. As I said before, what we do as a business, we look after the properties, we refurb them, we clean them all the time. We inspect them through our our softwares and our apps, through our cleaners and our maintenance team. You know, so we are we're not like a normal tenant. So we don't need an age. You don't need to pay an agent to to manage us as the tenant because we're just an amazing tenant. We manage ourselves and that's the spin-off benefit to you. But if you ever want proof of us managing ourselves, we've got it. We can send you photographs. We can let you in the door, whatever you want. Um, For hotels, do we offer everything the same? Pretty much, pretty much, yeah. Just give us the property, do a a deal and, um, and go from there. Um, one thing that I do, um, and again, I'll come on this tomorrow. And if I do forget, someone remind me, um, the way that I set need the deal setting up in an ideal world now is like all bills included. Um, that helps, helps with the, the, the VAT scheme that we're on. Um, not always possible, but that's what I would like to push for. And again, I'll, I'll discuss that with you tomorrow. Hotels, um, you just remind me because I've just done a hotel deal and, uh, that was one of the things we've been negotiating on for, for the last week or two. Um, with a hotel, would you be looking to buy an outright rather than rent rent? Um, either. It depends. Depends if the numbers stack up. You could do a lease to buy, whatever. Um, a lot of hotel owners don't want to sell the buildings because they're worth a lot of money and they just want the rent out of them. You know, they might have worked in them for 20 odd years and, you know, emotionally connected to them. So, but I look at any option, anything that makes profit, I will look at. Um, that's kind of my ethos uh, with with regards to, to property and 
well, anything really in life, but um, anything that makes profit that I know about and I'm confident about, I'll take a look at. Um, with larger properties such as five and six bedrooms, would you ever consider student like HMOs or student apartment buildings if they were to become available? Uh, I would, but just remember what I said before about studios. Um, and um, I do get offered these type of things quite often, you know, 56 beds, but they're all shitty little studios and therefore it's no different to a hotel room. Then we stack the data up and they don't actually work financially based on the rents that they want. Um, but HMOs, student led HMOs, I've taken quite a lot of them on uh, over the years. They are ideal type of properties. The only downside I have found is the majority of them are not in great condition. So um, the landlord would have to get them into the right condition if they do want to work with us. And again, I'll come on to that tomorrow as well about, um, well, we can actually discuss that now. Don't be afraid of telling the landlord of the type of conditions. We have a brand standard. Um, I'll go through some examples tomorrow because I haven't actually got any, but um, we have a brand standard that we have to adhere to. And if a property doesn't meet the brand standard, we won't take it on. So um, I've learned the hard way over the years of taking on shit and um, disappointing people. And ultimately it has a knock on effect to everything in the portfolio. So we've been really cleaning that up the last sort of 18 months. And um, I won't go back there. I'm only taking the brand higher and higher, you know, things like, the villas on, on, on the palm and, you know, the, the kind of million pound plus properties there. That's the way the brand I want to be seen as. I don't want to be seen as like cheap and cheerful. I want to be seen as, you know, um, high quality and high value. So if there's a student HMO, I'll take it on as long as it's nice. But I am yet to come across a really nice student HMO that's been lived in for a while. But, you know, on the flip side, you can say, landlord, take it for eight years, but I'm going to need some new carpet in here. I'm going to need, you know, that bathroom sorting out. I'm going to need, you know, those kitchen cupboards sorting out, whatever it might be. And they might say, well, yeah, all right, fair enough. You've signed for eight years. I'll, I'll do that for you. You know, so it's just about having that conversation and figuring out where you're at. Uh, don't be scared to push back on things, you know, um, and, and tell them what we need to get it into brand standards. I think when you do that as well, they also see you as, all right, fair enough. You know, these guys obviously need it in a good condition, so they must keep it in a good condition. Um, you know, it'll be worth the investment in the long term, um, you know, because there's no voids, blah, 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 and everything else we've talked about so far. Uh, is there a limit to the amount of bedrooms you would want? Um, securing a house. So we did have a 10-bed house before, and it didn't work. Um, we ran it as one house. We also ran it as individual rooms. It just didn't work. Again, that it totally depends on the location. Like, you know, I stayed in, I stayed in a fourteen bed house in Archerfield not so long ago, and it was, you know, it worked, you know, and it's fully booked every single night of the week. Uh, but that's unique. It's you know, it's an, it's almost like an event type property, um, and uh, you know, it's grand and and things like that. So I'm not saying it wouldn't work, but I think for the standard run of the mill stuff that is you know on on every uh, every other street uh, i think probably no more than a six bed house um for what we do and who we're looking to attract uh in, in the main but I, each opportunity on its own merits but i would say and to be honest i think you'd struggle to find more than a six bed house in all fairness um you know in, in the general searching that you're going to be doing so, uh, but if you do come across something quirky, we again, we can have a look at it. It just depends on the numbers. Um, uh, but if you're interested in buying property, what is the criteria? Um, for me, it's blocks of flats at the minute. Blocks of flats uh, is typically my criteria right now. Um, if I'm buying stuff, I'd rather, um, you know, if I can buy whatever, 15 flats, you know, million quid, 1.2, 1.3, whatever, uh, you know, put in three, four hundred grand and just get them cash flowing straight away. That's pretty much the type of stock that I'm looking for right now. Um, and I've got my asset team looking for on the ground as well. So, uh, right, let's just dive back into this. Um, where can we find properties? Uh, anywhere really, but um, right move is a good place as any downside. Obviously, right move is pretty much connected agents, uh, you know, book viewings, get on viewing, speak to agents, uh, get the phone going, inquire on stuff, and um, and you will uh, make moves. You can download, um, I'm pretty sure that let me just um, 
I haven't done this for a while, but I'm um, pretty sure it will still work. Come on, escape. So on right move, I'm I've got my uh... yeah so there's this little chrome extension here called property log so if you go onto uh there you go this this extension here uh, can i share this uh, no, I don't think I can. It's called Property Log anyway. If you just Google Property Log Chrome extension uh, and bang it in, what it does once you've then set it up, it then shows you here when if there's been any price changes. So um, obviously of late things do tend to go quite quickly, but if there's a property, like you see this one here, um, it was first. Oh, you, I mean, obviously, it shows you when they're first listed as well. So these are obviously just listed today. So I wonder if I've got newest search on by maybe. Uh, I don't know what search I might have on. Let's have a look. Yeah, newest listed. Uh, let's just go highest price. So you'll see here, this one here. Um, it's been on since um, when's that? July. So actually, no, sorry, it's been on since December last year, 15 grand a month, 15 grand, 15 grand, down to 13 grand, now down to 11 grand. So you can see that, I mean, probably not the best examples here because we're looking at quite expensive houses, but um, you can see how the price is dropping and how long they've been on for. The, the longer they've been on for in, like, I, I know this area, so most of the people that have got these houses probably don't give a shit if they're sat empty, but um, if it was normal people needing rent in these houses, then, you know, if they've been on for a long time, then they're going to be more motivated to pretty much work with anybody that just gives them a call and offers them the money. Um, but I would also be a bit concerned that in, in today's market, a property that has been on for a while probably means that it's, it's massively overpriced or there's something wrong with it. So it would also be a warning sign to me, but that property log extension is a great way to, um, great way to find stuff uh, open rent again um very much just a very similar site you will also see properties on here from open rent so you you you're probably not getting me but you see these little badges here if it's advertised by open rent which means it's direct to landlord it will filter through oh there you go there's one there so you can see that that if you if you contact this one then this uh the contact form that pops up here or if you call them call agent 020 that will go through to the landlord because that means the landlord has advertised it direct via open rent um so uh and again you can search on open rent for you know properties wherever it's got the same area um and then again you can you can contact any contact made on here is direct to the landlord. Not all properties listed on here do go over to right move. Some people don't do all the documentation to get them on. Uh, they might just choose the cheapest ad. But you know, all these here, you can um, you can actually um, inquire about, and you will speak direct to um, to the landlords. So um, oh, that's one of ours. <laughs> so uh, we use this as a strategy for um, actually getting guests. So, um, but you can um, you can get. Uh, let's have a quick look. You can get a uh, good. You get you get direct to landlords. So basically, if you run that number, you get through to us. But um, so that's a, another great way. This is where you'll definitely. I picked a lot of business up from Open Rent. Um, the downside of Open Rent is obviously. People know that you get direct to landlord, so it's very, very, very active, and you've got to really punch above the um, you've got to really punch above the crowd. But uh, you can you can really get involved, um, and as long as you're you know opening conversations, you're persistent, you're constantly going back at people, um, then you will get deals. Facebook Marketplace, another you know great tool um, that you can use is is Facebook Marketplace. You can um, you know you, you can get good deals from it um it's just with i i i think facebook's a great tool it's just a case of um 
It's just a case of searching and doing a bit of legwork. Uh, so we've got Mark Place. And again, um, you know, you've got plenty of properties pop up. It's just a case of, of going through them. Obviously, you've got filters here that you can do, um, you know, date listed, minimum prices, sort by, you know, whether you rent and buy and all that sort of stuff. So um, you just got to go through them and narrow your filters down, click into them, make inquiries, open conversations on Messenger, and you'll get the result. Um, next one is, is Facebook groups. So uh, this is, you know, there's loads of groups like um, rent in Newcastle. Uh, so there you go. We've got rooms to rent in Newcastle, properties to rent north. So, you know, I don't think I'm in this one. I'll see if I can see anything in it though. Um, so, you know, you've got your, your discussion here. You've got people. Um, I'm looking for a bed, hi all. Uh, you know, so you get a lot of people looking for properties, but um, you will also get, um, you know, people actually posting properties in these types of groups as well. Again, it's just a case of spending the time scrolling through them. And then when you do, um, you know, you do get one, then obviously you just send them a message and um, and go into conversation with them. Ideally, you want to like their post and then comment, I've sent you a DM, because then they'll actually go and check their DMs. If you're not friends with them, it'll go into the spam folder. Um and then what you'll do is just, hey, um, and get in the direct message with that, hey, can you tell us a bit more about the three bed house you've got advertised in whatever group? And then just, again, just go into conversation with them. Um, Pepper for Facebook. Uh, so uh, this is an amazing tool. And um, uh, I, you, there's a, I'll get you a link if you want it, if you want to download the software. But effectively, it's called Pepper here. So um, what you could do in this just actually i'm not a member of this group so it won't work but let me just go to uh landlords uh, i remember this one so this is obviously a group full of property investors and landlords go to members tab which should be somewhere um, Why can't I see the members tab? Bizarre. Here we go, members tab. So you open the members tab and then you've got all these members. What we're gonna do is Pepper just sits in the background on a daily basis. So you'll see here, I've got this landlord message so um, you can set it up where you go dashboard um, and you go like this landlord rent around prospect and it'll search for anybody with these keywords in their title. And then, um, uh, you know, I wanted to discuss the eight year rent guarantee, blah, blah, blah. So what you then do, got this, got your members tab, get a little pepper open off your Chrome dashboard. And then we just send friend requests. And then what she does, as you're working away in the background, she just sits there at a little desk. And you can see there, we've already done 50 a day, so she won't do any more. Um, the team have obviously started that, but you see how that, she's like searching through the group. Yes! Oh, there we go. So uh, that's because we fit our daily targets. So, um, but she will just go quite slowly throughout the day, so it's not seen as spamming. And then what you do is you come back in, and then you go send welcome messages, landlords, send welcomes. So she'll then start to send 20 messages a day to all the people that have accepted the friend request that were initially tagged to the landlord. So you see there, we're going to try and send a message to Bob Plum because he was somebody that we've obviously connected with. Um, and that'll just be everywhere in the background. And then what happens is those responses will come back in. You see there, it's opened up Bob Plum's Facebook feed and it's going to try and send him a message. Um, that yeah, message probably sent. Um, and, and then all that happens is, you know, for those that want to engage with you, they'll reply to the message and then that sits in your direct messengers and, and then you just take it from there and take the conversation forward. So um, if you actually go to, um, if you've got my link tree, um, I think it's official Ryan Luke. Pretty sure there's the link. 
Yeah, go that that lethal prospecting tool here, um, and then you'll be able to at least get a fourteen day free subscription to Pepper. Um, but uh, you you know, and then you'll have to pay for it. But it's it's worth paying for in my eyes. Uh, we do it, it literally automates. Um, it's great. So uh, first and foremost, you want to be adding people to your profile that are going to be your ideal avatar, and then obviously you want to be prospecting them um, throughout the throughout the day, throughout the, the, the week, if you just set that away each and every day, you add 50 friends, you send 20 messages, um, you're going to get responses. Um, you're going to get responses from that. So oh, I think she's kicked me out because she's doing something. There in a sec. What's going on here? She's opening up my messenger conversations. Because she's trying to send messages to her sentence. I'm going to shut that down for now. Um, so they are um, in the main where you can get direct to landlord um, deals from. And uh, also, as you see, you can add in there building relationships by actually just ringing, ringing agents. Um, properties are everywhere. You know, again, another strategy that I've deployed before is... Um, just literally texting your whole phone book. Do you know anyone that's got a property to rent? Question mark. I guarantee you'll get people send you a message back saying, yeah, so-and-so down the road. Or they might be like, Ryan, I haven't fucking spoken to you since school. Why are you texting me? Um, you know, it just, it varies. But if you've got, I don't know how many thousands of people I've got in my phone book, but, you know, if you sat there and just sent 50 a day to you know, start a day and go all the way to Z, and just uh, as anybody, do you know anyone that's got any property? I'm after a favor. Do you know anyone that's got any property to rent? I guarantee you'll get people respond saying, yep, so-and-so, yep, so-and-so. And then they might say, why? You tell them why. And then, um, you know, and just ask if they know anyone and, and then you just go into it. So um, really easy way to to get deals and, and to, um, you know, to prospect and move things forward. So uh, let's just... Uh, have a look at some of the questions uh, from that section. If anyone has any other questions, ping them in the chat on any of this. Um, uh, da, da, da. What radius from our hometown are you expecting us to search in? Search in whatever radius you want. Um, I searched three and a half thousand miles away from mine and ended up in Dubai, and now I'm searching over many miles away. <laughs> I'm in Miami. So uh, naturally, it's easier to search on your doorstep because you want to be trying to get any... Um, uh, you want to be trying to get the most amount of urines under your belt as you possibly can. I was doing about 25 a week when I first started. I was obsessed. Um, but I think you need to be if you want to if you want to make this work if you want to get out there and make some money. Um, if you can do it on your doorstep, great. If you can't, I know I've had you know people that I've worked with in the past who you know might lived in London and chose Stoke as their area, for example, and they just go up there for the weekend to get an Airbnb on a Saturday night and they do loads of you on Saturday, loads of you on Sunday, and bang in twenty twenty five still that week, but only do them across two days. So. Just depends. Uh, once you start getting out there, you'll start to get a feel for. Um, you'll start to get a feel for the areas and whether they work and whether the deals are stacking up. Um, and which you know we'll go over tomorrow how to do that. And then from that, you might start pushing out of area a bit. You know, I started on my doorstep and then tried a different city just because I wanted to expand further, not because it wasn't working, and then just kept expanding and expanding. So. Um, but if you can do it on your doorstep and get enough money out of that, then absolutely fine. Um, Sean, do you recommend any rental websites to Dubai? Yep, Dubizzle, um, Dubizzle, Bayut. Um, Bayut's probably more companies like ours doing short-term rentals, but no, there are, uh, there are, some, there are some stuff on there. Uh, Propertyfinder.ae. Um, so there are... Um, a, a little tip with Dubai, if you can... Um, if you can get the door number of the building, uh, I've got a database of every single landlord in Dubai for every single area. So we can actually get, get direct to the landlords and cut the agent out. Um, if you can get the actual door number, it might mean you need to go on a viewing, uh, but, you know, and find out, you know, that it's whatever, 603 in, 
Shoreline 7, uh, for example. You get us that, we can then get the, the landlord's number off the database, and then we can prospect the landlord direct, uh, try and get a better deal. Some landlords like that. Some landlords obviously don't. Um, the buy just with the cultural differences and the way people operate, some are very much just like, I literally want nothing to do with my properties. Let the agent deal with it. I don't care how much fees I've got to pay with them. Some are like, yeah, great. I'm quite happy not to pay any fees to them and, and work with you. Um, so, um, I mean, Dubai works a bit differently because the tenant actually pays the fees, not the, not the landlord, but still, um, I think that direct landlord relationship still works a lot better for us and for the landlord uh, when it's built. So, um, so those three main websites really, um, what, when researching what areas profitable is, uh, Dean? no, and no, it's not, I'll go over this tomorrow night though. Um, I am purposely wanted to break the sections up, uh, because there's a lot of information on that side of things. Uh, is it down to us? You will initially, yes, decide whether it's profitable or not to submit the deal. And then we will naturally, you know, I don't spend any money without uh, either myself or my team checking everything over. Uh, I think you'd be a fool <laughs> to just trust um, anybody figures. Doesn't matter. You know, even if I've trained people, I will always still have a quick look over the numbers. Um Come six months time, some of us are still around with you. Uh, I would like to think that all of you are still around. Um, but, but, but where do you grow from here? Yeah, great question. So uh, again, I'll cover that tomorrow night. Um, it's all in tomorrow's presentation, but there's plenty of opportunities. Where do you send deals to? I'll cover that tomorrow night. Uh, we don't have to worry about tenants then. Nope. Um, did some background research and some people were saying that were legal requirements in order to start deal sourcing, such as PI insurance. Is this correct info? Um, yeah, I did put a call into my insurance company today, um, and I haven't had the answer that I need yet back from them. I would, it depend on what you want to do. Um, there's, there's, there's ways and means of, of looking at it. I mean, you, you should always, I think, no matter what you're doing um, as a consultant, you should always have some form of, you know, professional indemnity cover. It just protects you from anything that might go wrong. Um, but uh, in this short period of time until I find some answers out, then um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, but if you if you want to get it set up, if this is, you know, where you see yourself going, or if you've already got a limited company, then you should potentially have that type of insurance anyway, uh, but you can also get it as a self-employed agent. You don't need to have a limited company to get PI insurance. Um, and for the level of cover that you'll need, um, it, it wouldn't cost that much anyway, but I am still trying to almost see if we're going to operate on the basis that you are consultant for my company uh, as a consultant and therefore, um, you know, maybe covered, but I haven't had a clarification on that yet. So I will have to find out. Um, I try, I just tend to pass that on to my brokers and, and ask the questions. I'm waiting for a call from them, but uh, hopefully I'll have an answer for that by the end of tomorrow. Uh, but, 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 there's just this training session today and then there's another one tomorrow. Um, I haven't quite decided what time tomorrow. Uh, I need to see what else is going down, but I will ping you all an email two emails in a week so you're very lucky um i'll ping you all an email tomorrow um in fact no let's say um six o'clock tomorrow night and use the same link that you've used tonight and then we'll rock and roll with that so 6 p.m tomorrow night training um you won't get an email from me just put, put it in your diary now um and then and then we'll go from there and then that's it so hopefully by the end of tomorrow you'll be fully clued up know what you're doing and ready to rock and roll um and then obviously i'll i'll give you some communication channels for you know any um loose questions that you may have as you're out and about uh trying to find deals and, and exploring stuff uh when you mentioned you doing 21 viewings in your first week was that just only to achieve getting one property yeah, I mean, I was doing 25 viewings a week, not just in my first week. Obviously, I got better at it as I got more and more experience. But yeah, that, that was my ratio, 25, and I'd get one property. I would book 25 viewings. I'd probably attend about 19. 
um, I'd go on and make offers on about 11 and I'd get one. But then as I got better, I got to the point where I was attending seven viewings because I'd identified better properties that I knew that worked. And I was getting about one, um, I was getting about one deal out of every seven before I stepped out of the, the deal sourcing side of things uh, on, on the front line, should we say. So uh, I, I would think if you, if you get on 20, 25 viewings a week, you'll, you'll absolutely smash the targets that that um that you you know that you want to achieve the money you want to achieve um have you done these training courses before and how many of them have been a success um yeah i, I used to do a lot of mentoring i used to do a lot of uh, the only thing i do now is for the franchisees um and we do very regular training courses on you know we did one last night on on deal finding and finding investor money um and yeah they, they all get the success isn't down to me like you know you, technically you can go and find all this information on youtube if you really want to obviously there's a few golden nuggets that you throw in that have worked incredibly well for me but if you just f focus on all of this do two to three hours minimum per day do 25 viewings a week i guarantee you you'll make more than 10 grand a month um it's not a case of is it has it been successful for other people it shouldn't really, that doesn't really matter. You, all you care about is can you make it successful for you? The answer to that is yes. If you apply the information and do the fucking work, no one's going to do the work for you. Um, that is the only caveat that ever comes with any training course. You know, you can go and probably sit on the worst training course out there, but if you applied the work 120% over a six month period, I guarantee you'd get results from it. So, um, uh, are you willing to pay the 5% for auto fee to secure the apartment villa in Dubai? Uh, it depends on the deal. So it depends on the deal. If I do, I have to factor it into the numbers and then we will see if the deal still stacks up on the payback period, uh, which again will go through tomorrow. Um, but if the deal works, then yeah. Uh, but if we can get away with not paying the 5%, then obviously it's, it's even better for us. So um mm, mm, mm. are the properties put on airbnb or just your own site the properties are put absolutely everywhere um we don't um my, my max gonna run out of battery. uh we don't hide the fact of what we're gonna do you know i tell everybody what we're doing you know there's there's no there's no secrets uh in, in the business it doesn't work operating under that formula so um we have to uh, tell them what we're doing, why we're doing it, and especially in Dubai because we need them to sign certain documentation to actually say um, to get our DTCM licenses and stuff like that as well. So, um, so we have to uh, tell tell everybody what we're doing, um, and you know, naturally, their properties will go all over the internet, so it's not like you can hide from it anyway. Um, do, do, do. Just curious, are we your first set of property sources? Uh, no, I have um, a team of five in the UK who are employed, and I have a team of four in Dubai and scaling quickly over there as well. So um, that's that. And then I've got my franchisees as well, who are classed as almost deal sources because they're on the front line sourcing as well. Um, and we have about a dozen of them at the minute. So um, you're not, uh, you are uh, the reinforcements, should we say, to try and boost the volume uh, because, uh, you know, we naturally as a business uh, have grown and, and continue to grow and we, you know, have a surplus of funds that is constantly building every month. Plus, the more we work with investors and um, show them what we're doing, the more that they then want to, to pledge as funds as well. So it's getting to a point now where, um, we just need more people finding deals, which is why I'm willing to invest my time into training you guys and giving you the opportunity and putting, you know, a lucrative reward behind behind it all to to find the deals and bring the deals. So, um, so so yeah. So unfortunately, you're not um, the first, um, but you are um, going to be just as cared for as the rest. And um, you know, as long as you put the hard work in, you'll you'll 100 get the results. Uh, 
Were the ones you employed brought in the business similar? Have they been brought in? Um, various ways. I don't really think that matters in all fairness, uh, but various ways. Some were just employed straight off the bat. Um, some worked as consultants first and then proved themselves and then wanted a bit more security. Um, some I had to poach from other companies and match wages and stuff like that. So it just, it just it's varied. Um, it has varied over time. Um, in terms of payment to us between the pound and the percentage uh, any advice on it I think it totally depends who you are I mean um, I remember when I was working in the financial advising game we had the choice of, of taking an upfront fee or a drip now, my idea was, well, I'm I'm going to do this for a long period of time. So if I build a drip up, then, you know, every month I've got a certain amount of money coming in. And, you know, once that gets to a certain point, then, you know, it, everything else is kind of the way I think about it is, you know, that's paid for, that's done, that's done. And But um, it depends. I think it depends on your circumstances. If you need an injection of cash, you might um you know want to run on the the upfront uh, fee there's uh, i think that someone did ask the question back on email can't remember who it is forgive me but um whether you could switch and uh, yes you can so you know if you've signed it one way then you decide you want to go another way you can it's just any deals that have been paid out will not be backdated that's the only thing i did say but for any you know from the day you say i want to switch any future deals we can pay you out on the different um, the different formats so uh, just whatever works for you really um, for me uh, I would uh, the drip would be more over a, over a period of time for sure um, you know if you, if you you probably worked on I don't know on average maybe £100 per month per deal so after 10 months then obviously the drip becomes more lucrative than taking you know the, the, the one off fee but again, it's um, it, it's up to everybody. Um, I think everyone's personal and, and everyone's going to have a different opinion on that one. Uh, what was the deal, the reason for the restraint order in the contract? Um, I am assuming that you're talking about the fact that I don't want to talk about the company should and they go wrong. I think um, whilst I certainly don't think um, anything should go wrong or can go wrong. Um, but I think sometimes, and I've seen it many times with employment, that, um, you know, sometimes things can end, probably not on the greatest terms for no one's fault, really. Um, and, you know, I'm a big believer that, you know, you should be professional about things on both sides and, and just have a chat about it rather than, you know, jumping on social media and giving some false facts, which... Um, happens far too often uh, to many businesses around the world and many people around the world. So that's pretty much the reason for that clause in the contract. Uh, but hopefully I don't really ever see it being executed. It's just something that we uh, um, have you know, been recommended, uh, especially when we're doing kind of the franchise agreements and some, some recent employment contracts. Solicitors have, have asked us to put that in, in contract. So that's kind of why it was put into this one as well. I mean, deals month to expectation. Um, I'd like to think that most uh, people would be bringing in minimum of five, which is, you know, just more than one a week. And I think once you get on a roll, then, um, you know, that should be the case. I think first month would very much be uh, just, you know, let's see how you get on first month. You know, the first month's always probably the first few deals, always going to be the hardest few. But um, then, you know, th th then, you know, just go from there. But I think, I think really five a month thereafter is is probably the expectation. Um, I hope some of you can pick up some blocks of flats, which will obviously help add to that volume. Uh, say probably makes 5K per month. Uh, do you get, yeah, you get you get 20% percentage of the 5K. So yeah, you do. Um, as a social, should I check with you first regarding a suburb, Emirate, or whether you have the capability to manage short stay properties in the area? We can manage anywhere in the world. I firmly believe that. If we can get cleaners and maintenance people on Mars, we can manage property on Mars. Um, with regards to the suburbs of the Emirates, I know we had an inquiry today about Raz al Khaimah. I think someone's got quite a bunch of villas out there. We're just actually looking into that to see 
how we can maybe navigate around the licenses because naturally I don't want to set up a new company just to operate in um, a certain area for a certain like a small amount of properties um, but we just need to have a look at it you know we just need to see uh, what what the the licenses are I know Abu Dhabi's just recently changed and relaxed things a bit around kind of the short-term rental market so um, just depends where they are uh tomorrow will you give us a one to ten strategy that thought would be successful um not really <laughs> i'm kind of giving you the strategy now to follow to be successful uh just kind of make notes on what's been taken back. i will be showing you how to analyze stuff but in terms of where you're going to get the deals that's kind of what we've covered off today uh, there really is no magic to this it's just hard work and building relationships and doing enough of it uh flat I'll, I'll buy anything out right if it's right um uh, or rent it I'm, I'm really not fussed which way i do it i'll just take any deal um how would you find landlords want to sell blocks of flats um commercial estate agents uh they tend to be the ones because they probably sold them the block or the building to develop so they're they're they're, they're the particular people that you got to work with to build those relationships um, and then, you know, again, you build them and they know exactly what you want and you constantly build them and then you go there and there and there. So, um, right. I am. Um, um, thanks very much for your time. It's, 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 it's been a good session. Um, any other questions we'll kind of spill in tomorrow. Just keep them at the top of your tongue. Uh, I'll see you back here at six o'clock tomorrow and we will go through kind of everything else. And then hopefully by the end of tomorrow, You'll have all the questions in your head answered and a bit more of a, a guide and a strategy of how you're going to do things. Um, and then obviously you can you can start hitting the ground from um, from Saturday. Uh, but uh, thanks very much for your time, everyone. I do appreciate awesome, it. Man, and um, uh, I look forward to working with you guys. And I'll see you back tomorrow. Thanks, Ryan. See you, Ryan. Take care.